very uh, long-standing friend of the NPF, uh, Mark Lowe, who was formerly at the University of Pittsburgh and the Section Chief of uh, Pediatric GI there and is now at Wash U, um, who's going to speak to us about nodal advances in pediatric patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And it's a pleasure to once again be at the National Pancreas uh, Foundation's Fellow Symposium. I think it's a wonderful event and has been very successful. And I'm going to talk about notable, oh, I didn't even touch it. Yeah. Notable advances in uh, pediatric pancreatitis, and it's my financial disclosures. I do have a couple non-financial disclosures to make. Um, first of all, this is going to be more of a medical history than a medical science talk. I'm not a historian, uh, but I have been interested in the pancreas for a long time, since 1980. And prior to that, I studied a uh, <clears throat> minor accessory of the pancreas, the liver. So I've been uh, a student for a long time. And the second thing is, uh, for the mentors uh, that haven't gone up for their afternoon nap, um, there seem to be a few, um, the choices uh, of studies that I'm going to highlight are, are my own. They're my opinion, no one else's. And if I don't, haven't chosen to highlight one of your studies, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, a, that it's an important work. So. The first, probably the most important of in, 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 is that children get pancreatitis. And this was a paper that came out in 2002 reporting the changing incidence of acute pancreatitis in children. And it showed a 20-fold increase in cases as shown on the uh, graph uh, from 1995 to 1998 and showed a steady increase in cases. And this set off a number of other studies uh, in a number of places, including one by uh, Veronique in Pittsburgh, that showed similar increases in the diagnosis of pancreatitis all over the world. Studies were done in Mexico and in uh, Florida. And it was a realization that, yes, children do get pancreatitis. And they get it more often than ever previously thought. And Cecilia's story today was not uncommon. Many children were told they had a stomach virus, go home, tough it out, when they actually had pancreatitis. The other point that I want to make for the fellows is that this was a single author, single institution, retrospective observational study that really had a huge impact. So this can be done. The other point is that when Jim did this, he had uh, five reversions before, revisions before it got published. And that tells me two things. One, he probably needed a better mentor, or a mentor, which is very important. That's been uh, emphasized. And, and two, that perseverance is really important um, whenever you're doing any kind of investigation. The next um, important event has already been mentioned today. And uh, the first author insisted that I bring it up uh, today. Um, <laughs> And this actually is important because it ushered in the genetic era to uh, pancreatitis. And as we'll show through the next slides, it's been very important in understanding the etiology of uh, pancreatitis in children. So the report that hereditary pancreatitis is caused by mutation in catiotrypsinogen gene really is a landmark study in our field. This was followed shortly by two other studies uh, looking at CFTR. These were done by internists that showed that the relationship between mutations in the CF gene and idiopathic pancreatitis in adults and in some children. They came out uh, together at the same time. And this furthered the idea that um, genetic studies were important, uh, genetic variants were important in the etiology of chronic pancreatitis. But the pediatricians already really knew this. It's a paper uh, published in 1975 by Harry Schwachman uh, showing that it recurred a competitive pancreatitis in patients with cystic fibrosis with normal pancreatic enzymes. Although the studies by the interns did e extend the, um, and the idea that variation, genetic variations in CFTR could have much milder phenotypes than been appreciated before or have single organ phenotypes. So the idea that genetics were, uh, played a, a huge role and that continued. This is a paper from uh, a German group, Heiko Witt, who's a, a pediatric gastroenterologist, showing that SPINK1 variants in children with CP um, were quite common and found they, they found it in 23% uh, of the 96 kids that they looked at. They were all unrelated. 
So this was a very high percentage of them had a mutation in, in SPINK1 and was probably the first suggestion that kids might be a rich, rich resource of, or source of genetic variants. And that's sort of summarized in this table that shows that most children through multiple studies, multiple countries have shown that CP, uh, children with chronic pancreatitis have re, uh, genetic risk factors. Uh, the table shows, um, it was published the year from between 2006 and uh, 2017, variety of countries. Uh, these are the genes that were examined. Some, uh, this study had more than others. And if you add these all up, it says that about 57% of children with chronic pancreatitis. I think recent data suggests that that number is going to be closer to 75% of children have genetic risk factors that contribute to their development of chronic pancreatitis. And for me, that is a source of great hope because I think these uh, variants and the pathology that they call can be addressed medically and that there is hope in the future we will be able to uh, uh, treat these diseases and treat them before they become chronic pancreatitis because we know that 95% of children who develop chronic pancreatitis have recurrent episodes of acute pancreatitis uh, before they develop chronic changes. And I think there's an opportunity for us to intervene and stop those recurrent uh, pancreatitis and uh, develop the genetic risk uh, and, and prevent the development of pancreati chronic pancreatitis. Let's switch a little bit, and this um, shows the etiology of acute pancreatitis in children um, circa 1999, 2000, before. These studies mostly came from academic institutions based on their experience. And what I want to point out is that biliary pancreatitis is thought to only be about 8% of the etiology in children at that time. And, in, um, and that has increased. Now we know that this started, that it's really a close, closer to a third, 28% of kids have this. And the first, uh, where's it coming? Hmm. Oops. There, oops. I'm having the same problem. Boom. Well, what's it doing? You press forward and it goes back. Press back, forward, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it's got a mind of its own, what can I say? <laughs> um, and, in, 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 and the first indication for this actually came from a presentation at our National Pediatric Gastroenterology Association by a group from Tufts in 2006. And I, they've actually never published this study. But it was the first time I actually recognized or realized that biliary pancreatitis might be more important in children. And there, there have been a number of reports since this confirming that. But this was a national database study of hospital admissions that included not just academic centers, but community hospitals. And the reason that they found more um, biliary pancreatitis than had previously been reported from academic institutions is because a lot of the kids at that time were being treated at the community hospitals. The anesthesiologist surgeons were willing to do uh, adolescents, younger kids at that time and, and uh, treat their, their gallbladder pancreatitis, so they never made it to the tertiary centers where they were identified and reported previously. So the recognition that biliary pancreatitis um, is a more important cause of acute pancreatitis in children is, has been very important and, uh, in, in both how we think about and manage these kids now. Next, um, I think uh, technology can be good, technology can be bad, but I think in, in large part technology has been good uh, for, for uh, pediatric pancreatitis. And like many things, it trickles down from the adult world. And so these are two of the top, or the uh, two early papers uh, talking about endoscopic therapy of pancreatitis, or ERCP, diagnostic therapeutic role of ERCP in children, one from um, Milwaukee, I forgot. This one comes from um, and there were others, uh, actually some papers that maybe have been a little earlier than 1993, but that showed that we could do these safely in kids. And also the impact of uh, endoscopic ultrasonography uh, in children. And my bias is that EUS is going to be a, uh, probably the predominant endoscopic um, modality in, in children uh, moving forward. Uh, and, and will contribute a lot. So the ability to do these, the recognition by companies, we need slightly smaller scopes, and uh, 
the more widespread availability of these techniques, I think, have greatly changed how we manage uh, kids with uh, pancreatitis. Uh, additional technology, we've already talked about uh, MRIs, um, MRCP, I think, um, and the ability and understanding that we can do MRCPs in, in, in children, even uh, free breathing, although they're still done in younger kids with anesthesia. Um, has greatly supplanted the use of the uh, uh, diagnostic ERCP in pediatrics as it has, I think, in the adult world. I think it's been a huge uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, aid in, in helping us uh, manage these, these children. So both uh, endoscopic and, and radiographic techniques, and I suspect there will be others on the horizon uh, in development that will make it uh, easier for us to manage these kids. Now, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention the NPF Fellow Symposium. And this is a graph of, hmm, my axis disappeared here, but anyway, this is number of pediatric gastroenterologists at the meeting uh, versus year. Uh, you've heard many times that it started in 2006, and 2006 isn't on there because there were no pediatric gastroenterologists. I became involved with uh, the NPF in, in um, 2006, I didn't attend that fellow's symposium. I think it was after that. But I did have attended every one since, starting in 2007. And um, Veronique came with me in 2007. And then uh, the next year, we had two Canadians, Tanya Gonska and, and Veronique. And then gradually, it, it slowly worked up, worked up. And then more recently, we had a, a peak in 2018. Maybe we'll have another one here, but that was almost a quarter of the pay, uh, fellows that were there, I think, last year. More than that, more than a quarter. So the interest has grown uh, tremendously, and I think this is an indication of, of, uh, of the recognition that started with that first paper by Jim Lopez, that kids do get pancreatitis and it's a problem. And this symposium has, uh, I think, encouraged a number of young pancreatologists, young pediatric gastroenterologists to continue um, uh, their interest in pediatric diseases, pancreatic diseases, and has made a huge impact. Um, I don't know, David isn't here, but I'll still mention Pancreas Fest. Um, I, I don't have the numbers for Pancreas Fest, but in 2009, there were two, pan two pediatricians there, uh, Elise, you and myself. And since that time, it's become an important meeting for pediatric pancreatologists. We get a large number of them every year, and that's had a big impact on uh, encouraging and um, uh, the, the pediatric gastroenterologist to start um, and uh, continue their interest in, in pediatric pancreatitis. So the NPF Fellow Symposium, I started out saying it is a wonderful event. I still think it is, and I hope uh, you, you all enjoy it, and we'll keep coming back. And send your trainees to future events. Um, as as uh, uh, David men, uh, mentioned earlier in the pediatric breakout session, 2009, um, listening to a talk by uh, Daraj Yadav, um, uh, explaining their database, talking about their database, I leaned over to Lich and I said, we should do something like this. And uh, unknowing to me, because I really didn't know her before then, I said that to the right person, and she took off uh, with a mission. And out of that, uh, developed Inspire which now has uh, 22 sites uh, throughout the world. To give you some idea of, of, of the difference, when I first moved to Pittsburgh in 2003, I contacted every pediatric gastroenterologist I knew who had ever said the word pancreas and uh, to try and organize a multi-center study to look at pancreatitis in childhood. I had three responses, uh, Peter DeReef, Steve Worlin, and, and Bob Rothbaum. Positive responses, everyone else, no one else uh, contacted even got back to me. Uh, it didn't get off the ground. There wasn't enough interest. But six years later, there was, and that interest is growing. We, we have people asking uh, to, to join Inspire um, frequently, and that growth has been uh, tremendous. And the amount of information that we have learned about uh, pediatric acute recurrent and chronic pancreatitis has been enormous. And that started out of a meeting. And that also has been, uh, the NPF and Pancreas Fest have also fostered that that growth. And so it's through education, uh, in inspiration, uh, talking with mentors, networking, that these things get off the ground. 
What we've seen is also an increase in publications about pancreatitis in ch children. These are by decade. One can see less, fewer than 600 in the, in the 1980s, not many more in 90. We're now going to probably get about 1,200 uh, in this decade. That's, that's the, uh, if it continues at the same rate, that's what I would estimate it would be. So there's not only been more interest, there have been more uh, publications. And I think that the work has, has been better. Most of the early work were case studies were case reports or, or uh, retrospective reviews of uh, institutional. But, and now there's, there's more information. And lastly, there's been official recognition in North America, and this was mentioned before. Uh, <clears throat> Veronique, uh, Veronique mentioned it. Uh, this particular uh, position paper, the management of acute pancreatitis in the pediatric population, and a re clinical report from the NASCO and Pedi Pancreas Committee. The important thing is the Pancreas Committee, uh, the North America, NASCO uh, stands for the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, <coughs> and they did not have a Pancreas Committee until about, what, five years ago? And Veronique was the first chair. Uh, she's moved on and others are taking over, but it's been a very active committee and very important. We're trying to get NASPGIN to put an extra P into, their, into the uh, acronym there. We haven't convinced them of that yet, but we'll get there and we'll make it and we'll be uh, fully a part of, uh, of NASPGIN. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, questions for Mark? I got a good question for you. So, what do you think the biggest challenges for the pediatricians moving forward with whatever diagnosing, treating, evaluating pancreatitis in the pediatric? Well, the largest, uh, the biggest challenge. Um, is something I said at this uh, symposium a couple of years ago with, when I was co-chairing a discussion with Marty Friedman, and I said the biggest challenge is to put the TPAIT surgeons out of business. And by that I mean we need medical therapy that can treat and reverse this disease. And I think that's not just pediatrics, that's the adult world as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that there is real hope that we can reach that goal. We have a better understanding of pathophysiology, um, many of these are protein misfolding diseases along with 100 other diseases. There's a lot of interest in finding um, drugs that can treat those. And I think the, the, that, is our, that is our major challenge. And that should be our, our, our long-term, short-term, every-term goal. Very good. Thanks. Right, thank you very much.